and a, it, and a, sorry, that's fine. Slammed her into the ground face down, broke her nose, and she got a deep, uh, a, a severe cut in her ankle and uh, glass, broken glass embedded all over her body. Um, uh, but Brenda was lucky. A, a good Samaritan stopped and helped her and Keith into his car and rushed them to the hospital. So she not only survived, she fully recovered, and she's here tonight <laughs> with her husband, Keith, and they've been married, what, 54 years? 55, 55 years. I mean, no, <laughs> So when I finish my part of this this program, I hope that we can hear some more from from Brenda and Keith. And then, um, hello, Rhonda. <laughs> there was another slide that's not coming up. So turn the mic on. So hmm. Oh, I, I don't know what happened. Sure so. over here where it's supposed to be. I'll try. Oh no. Just a minute. <laughs> okay. There we go. What'd you do? Just had to click on the screen. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So then about 30 miles to the east of here in Adams County, Ted Graber was at home with his wife and three children in his home in Lynn Grove. Um, that was in uh, Adams County. And, um, and there were also about 15 guests at their house and they were celebrating the Graber's uh, one-year-old daughter's birthday. When all at once, somebody looked out, spoiled everything, looked out the window and saw this tornado coming. So Ted grabbed, you know, he, he gathered everybody and told everybody to get down to the basement. So they, they, and he told them to line up along the west side of the, the west wall in the basement. So the, the tornado hit and you can see this was a really old house built, you know, really solid brick house built in the late 1800s. The, the, the tornado pushed the house off the uh, foundation. And when that happened, it, the west wall of the basement caved in and injured just, I think just about everybody who was down there. And one of the, the, the most severely injured was the Graber's four-year-old daughter who um, suffered a compound fracture in one of her legs. And she had a massive head wound that Ked, when he looked at her, he knew it was life-threatening. So as quickly as he could, he he you know got his daughter from underneath all of that debris and carried picked her up and he carried her uh, a half mile from his house down to the highway and he flagged down a passing motorist who got them to the Bluffton Clinic and it wasn't until the until they got to the clinic that um, Ted realized that he became aware of this excruciating pain in his back. And that was the first time that he that he found out that um, he had also been in in the in the way of that collapsing uh, wall in the basement, and it had crushed ten of his vertebrae. And finally, yes, and finally, just north of Sheridan in Hamilton County, ten-year-old Brant Graham and his uh, younger brother Brian and his and their parents Herschel and Rosemary were running from their house, trying to get to the car uh, as this tornado was approaching. They thought they could outrun it, but of course they couldn't. And, and uh, the, the, when, the, when it got close enough, it blew them all in a different direction. And when it had passed, Herschel and uh, Brandt found each other and they were relatively okay, all things considered, but they couldn't find Rosemary or Brian, uh, yeah, yeah, Brian. And, um, and they later found out, they later found Rosemary in a field, you know, I don't know, you know, like a block away. And she was, she was dead and they found uh, Brian, but he, he didn't last more than another two days at the hospital because he was so severely injured. And, and when Brian and Brent told me the story, 
And, and I met him at a, an event like this later. Both times he said that he has never understood why he survived and they didn't. So with those stories, did anybody here go through anything like that? Except of course you did, but <laughs> um, have it. Um, well, I'll just tell you, I didn't. I lived, I was a teenager and I lived in Tipton in Tipton County. And um, uh, it, luckily for me and for Tipton, it wasn't hit. And um, so my evening was relatively uneventful. Um, so however, most of Tipton County lost power, which is probably why we didn't have a clue what was going on about 13 miles to the north of us in the Howard County town of Rusheville. Are you all familiar with Rusheville? Okay. Um, you know, it was almost wiped off the map that night. But in Tipton, people didn't know what had happened there until Monday morning when the news started spreading by word of mouth because the power was still out. But eventually we learned that the tornadoes that had devastated Howard County were part of a collective rampage that had, that had uh, of, of three separate lines of storms that had torn through the state in less than three short hours. And they included um, a line in Northern Indiana from LaPorte and Stark counties uh, all the way to the Northwestern tip of Steuben County before it blew into Michigan. And then the, the line that we're all probably most familiar with was the one that started in Tippecanoe County and proceeded across central Indiana uh, through Clinton, Howard, uh, Grant, Blackford, Wells, and Adams counties before they finally uh, blew into Ohio. And then there was this third uh, line, there's the second central Indiana line that cut a 50 mile path from the eastern edge of Montgomery County all the way through Boone County and about halfway across Hamilton County before it lifted and, um, and that was the end of it. So in the final tabulation, the Palm Sunday tornadoes had torn up a total of six Midwestern states. And they were Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. Um, and those storms uh, injured thousands of people and left 271 of them dead and nearly half of them in Indiana, which included eight fatalities right here in Grant, Grant County. So clearly Indiana had taken the brunt that night. And yet, despite the horror that we Hoosiers endured that night, it's also what pulled everybody together. Those who could help immediately joined forces and pooled their resources and quickly devised ways to find their injured and trapped neighbors and dig them out. And they, they, they dug them out and got them out and they did this for hours and days and actually for as long as it took. So I think that we could all agree that the actions that uh, that 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 our, our, our Hoosiers, you know, uh, participated in that night. All their actions have revealed what we're made of. You know, pretty good stuff. So, I already mentioned that my town wasn't hit that night, but a few days later, I did personally witness some of the uh, the aftermath of the tornadoes that had ripped through Howard County when my dad took my mom and me for a drive uh, through and around the area of. Rusheville so that we could see the destruction. And I didn't know it until I was working on this book, but by the time my dad drove us through Rusheville, it and other little towns that had been destroyed by tornadoes were, were getting pretty sick of people like the Thorntons and they referred to us as sightseers. And if we had known that then, you know, I think my parents might not have, we might not have taken that drive. But, you know, it is true. We did want to see the sights because I don't think, in, at least in my wildest imagination, I could never have believed that such such uh, devastation was possible, especially so close to home. And I give the people of Rusheville a lot of credit for making the best of a, of a terrible situation by posting volunteers with buckets in the middle of Main Street, where they collected donations from the, uh, the, the sightseers and those cars passing through. And I vividly remember my, my dad tossing a few dollars into a, a bucket. So, so now 
I want to fast forward from 1965 to 2020 and tell you a little bit about how I decided to do this book. I've been looking for a book about the Palm Sunday tornadoes in Indiana for years, but aside from a couple of regional books um, that were out of print, I couldn't find anything. And I couldn't understand why nobody had bothered to do it because it was such an important event that it hit our state. And I felt like somebody ought to do it. So I finally thought, well, you know, why not? Why not me? So in the summer of 2020, I contacted the acquisitions editor at History Press and pitched the idea. And he kind of liked it. And so six months later, in January of 2021, um, I, he gave me the green light and a deadline. And I had until March of 2022 to get it all done. And, you know, I thought, wow, I was really happy about that because that's 14 months. And that would be seemed like way more than enough time to get this thing done. But as soon as I started the research, I quickly realized how little I really knew about the Palm Sunday tornadoes. I mean, I didn't even know there was a second central Indiana line, and I hardly knew about that northern line. So, um, I mean, may mainly I knew about Clinton County and um, Howard County because it was so close to home. So, um, so to find out all this information, I first dove into the old newspapers, which I must say is always a great resource when you're trying to uh, research the past. So I, 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 I dove in and I read every major news article um, about the Palm Sunday tornadoes in Indiana that I could find and I took volumes of notes. And then I found out that in May of 65, the National Weather Bureau had published a Palm Sunday Tornadoes report, and that had a lot of great information in it, which was very helpful. And then I found a film called Death Out of Darkness, produced by the Indiana State Police, which you may, probably a lot of you have already seen that. Are you aware of it? It's available, just Google it, and it's, uh, it's available online, Death Out of Darkness. So in addition, I contacted libraries and historical societies in all the areas that had been hit by the tornadoes. And I asked them for whatever materials that they had on file. And together, all these resources provided what I call a wealth of cold hard facts. But, you know, even before I started, I knew cold hard facts wouldn't tell the whole story. And not the story that I wanted to write. And I don't think it was a story that you would want to read. Uh, because my years as a newspaper reporter had taught me that when you want to get to the true heart of a story, um, you have to talk to real people who had experienced whatever it, the event was. You have to talk to the people who had experienced it firsthand. So that's what I did. And to find them, I posted notices on Facebook and I posted and I uh, sent uh, uh, news briefs to all the uh, area, all the newspapers that had served the areas that had been hit by the tornadoes. And I spoke with uh, librarians and historians and posted um, notices on community bulletin boards. And I told everybody that I, that I ran into and I, that I knew what I was doing and what I was looking for. So each of these, each of these things led me to people uh, or led people to me too, that had lived through the tornadoes and better yet, people who were willing to talk to me about it. So over the next nine months, I interviewed 120 people. So um, the people I interviewed ranged in age from their 90s who had been adults in 1965 on down to people in their 60s who had been as young as four back then. And everyone I interviewed laid out the details of their experiences and told me one horrific, heartbreaking story after another. But surprisingly, um, many of them also spoke of miracles and hope by telling about their narrow escapes and the acts of heroism that they had witnessed and then neighbors helping neighbors and even their own stories of how they started over. And I found it interesting too, that after I'd heard a few dozen stories, I began to notice some similarities such as and you probably have heard these stories yourself and maybe experienced them firsthand. There, I've heard a lot of stories about some item or a cherished heirloom that was that was that went through the storm and in perfect came out in perfect condition while everything around it was utterly destroyed. And another story that I heard a lot about were uh, 
was some kind of a document or a photograph that was gone with the wind, only to be returned, you know, sometime later by a thoughtful stranger from hundreds of miles away. Even one, one man told me about something that was returned to him from the east side of Ohio. And then, of course, I heard some stories about the beloved family pet that vanished in the storm, but returned, you know, uh, somebody brought it back or it came back on its own, you know, a few hours or days later. And in two unrelated, I consider bizarre stories, two people told me about um, that th as the tornado, you know, went by them, that they, the wind, uh, they knocked them down and rolled them up in their carpets like burritos. And they, they, they got through the whole ordeal, ordeal without a scratch. So, so those are just a couple of the, of the stories and I'm sure you've got plenty of your own. Now let's take a look. I wanna take a look at the weather that was leading up to that Sunday before, uh, before the air turned cool and the, and, the, and the wind picked up and the clouds rolled in. Um, the days that were leading up to that were kind of cloudy and chilly and damp. So that morning, Hoosiers were delighted when a, you know, an early morning shower cleared up and the bright sunshine came out and started warming things up to about 70 degrees. It was the, really the first very nice day of spring. So when people got home from church, they immediately would, you know, changed into their Bermuda shorts or fired up their backyard barbecue grills. And some of them took off the golf course or they jumped in their cars and went for a leisurely drive through the country. However, a lot of people told me that later on that afternoon, they began to feel that something was off with the weather. The, it, you know, the air started to feel really clammy and, and it was muggy. And then so they started seeing something going on with the sky. Do you remember seeing the sky? Did it turn a funny color? Do you remember? A lot of people, what color? Green? Who saw a green sky? A lot of people told me a sickening pea, pea green sky. And then the uh, swirling storm clouds began moving in. And throughout the day, the Weather Bureau in Indianapolis had been keeping an eye on an active storm cell that was moving from the Gulf toward the Northeast. And when it finally collided with a fast moving cold front that was headed West, you know, the results were these severe tornado producing storms moving from Northeastern Iowa into Southern Wisconsin, Northern Illinois and Northern and Central Indiana and on into Michigan and Ohio. And I think it's safe to say that many people today don't understand how little attention some of us paid to the weather forecast back in 1965. Uh, in those days, weather forecasting was kind of hit and miss. And often when a tornado was spotted and warnings were broadcast, there wasn't enough time to uh, seek shelter. And another problem back then was in the terminology. And because few people knew the difference between forecasts and warnings, and I'm not so sure that you know, everybody knows today the difference. And in the case of that Palm Sunday, the day was so nice, people were you know, outside far away from their TVs and their radios where they normally would have heard these warnings. And of course, there weren't any cell phones. And so, so these storms just caught people unaware. So now I wanna talk about where the tornadoes struck. In Indiana, the first tornadoes were reported just before six o'clock in Laporte and Stark counties. And within 90 minutes, the tornadoes had devastated communities in Marshall, St. Joseph, Elkhart and LaGrange counties. And those included areas of uh, Coons Lake and Tea Garden in Marshall County, um, Walkerton, there's Wyatt, and Midway Trailer Court um, um, in Elkhart County, just to the north of Goshen. And you've seen the 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 twin tornadoes, that's where, that's where those, those pictures were, the tornadoes hit right around this trailer park. And the tornadoes also hit um, on, on a little north of that trailer park, uh, a little, the Sunnyside Edition in a little town called Dunlap. 
and then it went on to the south of Shipshawana and areas east of there. So about the same time that the Linus storms all was moving out of uh, Steuben County and crossing into Michigan, another twister was reported 140 miles southwest of there uh, over the town of Odell in Tippecanoe County. And within minutes in, in Clinton County, the son of the Rossville town marshal stepped onto his back porch and snapped this picture of a twister on the ground just south of him, it was blowing past Mulberry. And this picture shows the aftermath of what had been a farm that was um, somewhere between Rossville and Mulberry. And it was the beginning of the line of storms that ripped a path across Clinton County and made its way into Howard County where it all but erased, you know where, Rusheville. And a little uh, to the northeast of there, a little tiny town called Alto. Uh, but even with that, the central Indiana storm line had barely gotten started. And a few minutes later at approximately 7.30, it blew through the south side of Kokomo, destroying several homes and the um, Maple Crest apartments, a church, a school, and parts of the um, Chrysler plant building, as well as a brand new building at Delco. And then it went on tearing through the county east of, of Kokomo, mercilessly ripping apart everything in its path and hit Greentown really hard before the storm crossed into Grant County, first blowing past the little town of Swayze. And there among the properties destroyed was the home of Helen and James Haven, uh, where their one-year-old son and four-year-old daughter were killed, as well as it caused Helen, who was six months pregnant at the time, to go into labor, and she um, delivered her baby the next day. And sadly, within hours, the baby died because of injuries that it had sustained in, that, in the tornado. And then there was one more uh, Swayze resident named Clarence Lavengood also was killed. And his body was found near the wreckage of his car in a muddy field just south of Swayze. And apparently as the tornado, well, he saw the tornado approaching his house, he decided uh, to make a getaway and he jumped in his car and tried to outrun it. But, you know, obviously he, he, he didn't make it. And, and, in a, um, and what's really sad, and I call it a sick twist of fate, the storm had not even touched his house. So from there, the, the tornadoes continued onto the uh, Northeast and hit the Three Acres Mobile Home Park at the junction, you know, of State Roads 9 and 37 on the Southwest edge of Marion. And one of the first, one of the first people that was hit when the tornadoes reached Marion was um, Charlene Smith, who I interviewed for the book. And she told me that she and her husband, Jim, um, were home that, well, she was home that evening and Jim was at work. She was home alone. And when the storm blew in, it was shaking her trailer around and she heard so much noise. She, she got up and looked out the window and right about that time, her trailer just exploded. And the, she says the next thing she knew, she was on the ground surrounded by debris. She was cut up real bad, she said, and covered in mud and blood and her left knee was shattered. And she said virtually every trailer in the court was destroyed. And there were witnesses who reported seeing furnishings driven into the trees. So as the storm continued on its northeastern path along the south side of Marion, it ripped apart everything in its way, including, oops, I'm sorry, that's the south side of Marion, it hit several houses. Um, and then it got to the Panorama Mall. Um, where it destroyed the uh, Marsh supermarket and several other stores, uh, which were very close, right? To where uh, Brenda had, had been sucked out of her car and slammed into the ground. And from there, the tornadoes um, reduced the um, Indiana, Michigan Deer Creek substation to rubble and proceeded to the Veterans Administration Hospital where remarkably no one was um, seriously injured. 
And another woman that I interviewed named Constance Shoby, whose story is also in the book, lived on the VA hospital grounds with her, with her uh, three young sons and her husband who worked maintenance at the hospital. Well, that night, shortly before the tornado hit, the family scrambled into their basement. And Constance said the house was gone in a flash, but the floor above them um, slid up a tree and left a gap just big enough for her and her family to climb out of. And I put that arrow because I think that's about where, where she was talking about. So they were able to get out of the house and Constance says that even today she feels so blessed that none of her family was injured. <clears throat> and now, before we move on to Blackford County, I have one last Grant County story that I wanted to share with you. And it's one of my favorites in the book. And it's um, the only one that I would that I can guarantee will make you smile. Um, and it was given to me by a man from Fairmount named, named Kevin Royal. You're here. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I didn't. We hadn't met in person, so I'm glad you're here. So, um, so according to Kevin, his dad John was always ready to reap the rewards <clears throat> of a good gas war. Now, I mean, I want to pause here to explain for those of you too young to re to know this. Back in the day, from time to time, gas stations engaged in something they called gas wars where they would keep lowering their prices in hopes of luring away their neighboring uh, gas stations customers. So that Palm Sunday, a gas war was raging in this area and Kevin's dad determined that the cheapest gas within driving distance of Fairmount could be found on the north side of Marion. And believe it or not, the average price for a gallon of gas around here in 1965 was 28 cents. So if John could fill her up for a quarter, a gallon, you know, 25 cents a gallon, well, that would be a savings of roughly 60 cents. <laughs> so that evening, off they went to Marion. And because John wanted to get as much of the bargain priced gas as he could squeeze into his tank, when the Royals left home, their car, their car was practically running on fumes right? <laughs> However, once they got to Marion's north side, instead of immediately filling up their empty tank, they stopped at Sandy's drive-in to fill up their empty stomach. <laughs> and this is where Kevin's story gets really good. While he and his family sat in the car eating their burgers and fries, the sky turned black and the wind picked up and that terrible storm blew in. And while it was destroying parts of the city south side, uh, the storm's northern tip did far less damage, although it did produce winds that rocked the Royals' car pretty good and pounded it with hail. And of course, the storm had taken out of the entire city's electricity, which meant pumping gas at any price would be impossible. So regardless, John started the car and using up his last few drops of fuel, he drove from gas station to gas station looking for one with power to run their pumps. But you know what? His efforts were futile. So once the tank was completely empty, the car coasted to a stop and there's where the Royals sat, you know, contemplating what are we gonna do now? And that's when a lost out of towner pulled up next to them and ask for directions to Anderson. So the stranger was the good Samaritan they had been waiting for. And when he found out their predicament, well, he invited them to climb into his Corvair and he gave them a lift home. So <clears throat> Kevin said that the night of the Palm Sunday tornadoes was the last time his father ever let the car run out of gas. So, so thank you, Kevin, for letting me inject this moment of levity, levity into this program. So, <laughs> so now, getting back to the tornadoes. After devastating the south side of Marion, they continued moving uh, eastward, of course, next striking the tiny towns of Rawl in Blackford County and Keystone in Wells County, where a twister demolished the Friends Church during its evening service before finally blowing into Adams County, 
where the tornadoes ripped through Lynn Grove and the north side of Bern before crossing the state line into Ohio at around nine o'clock. So then finally, around the time the tornadoes had reached Kokomo's east side, still another uh, storm line made its appearance in central Indiana, this one in eastern Montgomery town, in, or Mo Montgomery County in the tiny town of Mace, which was just to the southeast of Crawfords, Crawfordsville. And that line quickly blew into Boone County and, a, and ripped a northeastern path through the farmland north of Lebanon and at its worst, leaving a trail of damage a mile wide. And once it crossed into Hamilton County, the storm's path narrowed. Sorry, the storm's path narrowed, but the tornadoes were still powerful enough to rip apart uh, the Curryville housing addition, which was just north of Sheridan. And it also ripped apart the countryside north of Sheridan and on through Hamilton County countryside. Uh, before it finally dissipated south of Arcadia. And finally, uh, sometime between 9.30, I'm sorry, 8.30 and 9 p.m., the tornadoes in Indiana finally ended. And at that point, the clouds cleared and the stars twinkled. And on the ground, however, 137 Hoosiers were dead and more than 1,700 had been injured and the damages exceeded $30 million. So um, the Palm Sunday tornadoes had set the record for the worst tornado event in Indiana's history. And as far as I know, that record still holds. Uh, the one thing about this book, my book that I can't stress enough is that if it hadn't been for the 120 people who trusted me uh, with their firsthand terrifying heartbreaking, life-changing, you know, the terrible personal stories, I couldn't have begun to accurately describe what our fellow Hoosiers had gone through that night. So again, to all of them and to those of you who are here tonight, thank you. Thank you very much. So now I want to call on the people, you know, whose stories appear in the book, you know, let, let you introduce yourselves and, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what I just if you know, if you want to add to what I told about your stories, and then I want to open it up to anybody else who's in the audience who wants to share their Palm Sunday tornado stories. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, you want to go first, Brenda? Okay. <laughs> And we just wanted to get things to go to Ohio State recently. And so, as we're passing up past a good front yard, and looking for the front kind of, and back by the way, the front kind of, and the back of the way. And we know we're going up there, so we're being announced on the radio, the front end was just so crazy. And so we're thinking it's coming, going to the rain, and we're looking for more distance. And we're going at the end time of 64,000. And they put his own seat up in the car. They had an echo on the driver's side and one on the passenger side. But when they didn't tell him to send it, they took that. So as the one at the incline head like four times up that way, I saw a white tornado that commercial was the same the white tornado. I saw a tornado way, way, way more away. I was still the father. And we're going up and looking at him because he used to be back. And when I looked at him, he said that. Everything around us is still in the sea, not knowing when the second tornado. And then we were in the high of it, we the car up in the tornado, we took the car to the front of the city, the whole car stop back up in verbal, the way they go to sleep, and the car stuck down with the view. And I'm, I remember flying around up in the air, and I was holding my eyes with my hand, but I remember telling them it's been like hours or some seconds. But I remember not thinking of death. I remember thinking my mom and dad to be mad if you're not going to wear a <laughs> And so, uh, anyway, all of a sudden, we could have dropped to the ground. And I ran by the woods, all the money, and the woods, and I ran on the ground next to it, and we were looking down the woods. And 
my leg there, and then you can see sparks in the wire, you know, down. And I didn't know what he was, he didn't know our way. His part of the effort was getting. And so anyway, I saw guys on before me, and I'm looking to see where he is. And one of the guys was in one of the houses that were away. He was looking for his girlfriend, and he did not find his friend in the house. I found out later with the camera for his And he laid me passing it up, and I thought I had a spring angel from me, and it was like looking down my crazy. So I had both nose and stomach and looking down. And so it was cool to come in on the home office, and then I found the streets. And so we had two cars that come to board that stopped and didn't get the six tornadoes. I was going to the hospital. There was a guy talking on this car, but I didn't want to get in because I was crazy, crazy. I didn't want to flood this car. He said, You get in my car now. <laughs> so I'm going to get my doctor in the way. But anyway, he took to the hospital, and I did know that I had a hole in my foot, and he didn't ask if I was going to get in my dog, and he went to work and stuff. But if I had been in the past, I would have been super long, and in the grand, if I could have been free, it could have been free. I knew that it was going to be the time to get in. So, it was very important to me. He had a few steps to get the stairs off. But he was going to be very important. He was going to be a big oral piece of the whole house. Well, I observed in the uh, scratch uh, uh, on her ankle was a hole. So, the guy and the picture on it. Speak up a little bit so they can hear from the value of a fine. Thank you. Yeah, if you can kind of go to the front a little bit and speak so they can hear. Just, yeah, so they can hear. Okay. Can hear. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, brand new, not like Bonneville, yeah, brand new, and, and um, it's just bleeding all over the place. I had it once. Um, so, when we got to the hospital, I had to back up a little bit because an interesting story. And there was a girl that wanted to go to my gym, her father was killed. Nobody asked her. Before I knew. And uh, nobody asked. And so, we weren't automatically involved or anything, but I asked her. He, that he died last month, Dennis, and uh, Dennis Graham is a nerd. And, uh, and then I, uh, uh, for my 62 year old graduation, I really saw him in the car she was in. I took two Dennis to the Green Farm. I was only there when we located my mom. In the 65 tornado, she helped save the life of Brenda who became our wife. The story on that is um, we get to the, the hospital and it's a chaos. They had not yet turned on the generator lights, so we did flashbacks. And um, probably two minutes after I got the lights, the generator over the lights. And I spied Janice. And, well, I took her to the green farm. And then I went to take her. She was with the hospital. And, and then the, um, the hospital waiting room is, you know, from like this big right here. And there were many people in the room that would not see and it had been raining and mud and so on with paper and pods on this. And I see Janice, and I think Janice from Wilkins leading the door. And Janice, everybody wanted to get, of course, is chaos. And Janice was way here, and she went back in the hall and just killed the mouth of bed, and then got the window right on. And, um, she, uh, she was she was bleeding off and they said no one was sure they said, you know, it was a matter of minutes. So that's the thing. Then the uh, car, <laughs> uh, I put the seatbelts in it. 1964, our seatbelts were mandated. Before that, they didn't mandate seatbelts in cars. I had had a little toy racer that you actually raced around fast walking. And so I could go kart with the flesh of the body, and my dad put a long range of ball. And I knew the value of being held in that thing. And so I had the seat a bar and all that. I had a seat ball. And that's you know I had my statement on my uh the guy that she talked about that had a finger cut off that 59 Chevy or whatever what I said go look for Chevy. And you heard the story and it's true his windshield and so birds windshield was strong all that. Had a, had a straw or a stick the size of a matchstick, one side and the other side, right through the windshield. 
you will realize the force. If one thing hits you wrong, you're, you're done. And you're going to go and then go into the woods a little farther than a tree. You're done. And I just kept thinking, I'm like Linda, because the car would go up in the air and then boom, it'd be let down. And it wasn't rolling because I remember they're probably going to die because my head would hit the, head like, hit the ground. This was just a seatbelt. And but it didn't. Uh, I didn't get hurt in fact, it didn't get hurt at all. I wrote a cut on my nose, which was bleeding, and uh, the blood dried on me because when I went to the hospital, so I would go like this. And I looked in the mirror, and I just looked up, and it was nothing. Hit my chest uh, against the steering wheel, but it was bruised, couldn't see anything. I was not in, in danger. The state police took a picture of my car, just had to land in the ditch. They, they took a picture of my car. And I uh, said, the person in this car lived. Not like I lived in. I did not think very well. And, and the car was like maybe you know, a few years ago, maybe Twister came out. I was talking over lunch with my friends, and that was a good move. So I'm taking part of this car actually being sucked up in the air. <laughs> of course, I told him, yeah, I was in a car. And I actually knew. I hadn't got the car quite stopped in the front of the And I, I still probably been five or ten miles an hour pulling over. And the first thing I remember is a four by eight sheet of plywood from where it's flown, just blown into the air and then the car on the mm -hmm. And then I just, it was a tremendous sound and all this, and um, I was able to get out of the car. But I uh, guess uh, anything else important? Uh, no, Brenda was in the hospital. Like, exactly like the car. The car is pulled on. All you guys know what a quarter inch scope was, but I had lights that pulled on. And uh, being a teenager, we didn't think to ask the guy. I was at my mom and dad's eating, uh, eating lunch, and uh, the guy in Ohio called. So I found your license. You know how the Ohio border is, what, 40,000 or something? I didn't ask him anything, or he said, no, I didn't need to back. He said, yeah, was, he traced my license. And that's how I fell and that had gone. I also had rust repair on the floor of the of the car. I had aluminum. I had ribs. I trace of this rivets all along there, then bottled it over so you couldn't see it. That license plate was almost ripped off just like you put your hand in the picture and you could see it's not all there about three or three minutes. Uh, so it's, nobody can imagine how strong that wind is. You just you're at the mercy at this point it's just a lot better than the dots. This is that's what you can only you know my first was set down the car too, but I never did buy my first. A driver's license, and I just got paid a month. I mean, 75 cents an hour. <laughs> well, Brenda's the first, and she's the best. I'm not sure which, because when 9 11 hit, um, I was in my office in uh, New Jersey, northern New Jersey. I lived in New Jersey, we lived in New Jersey 34 years back here, year and a half after uh, New York City, which was kind of close to not safe in one way. So you say, what could happen? What so should you possibly be in worse than that? Well, I'm reading the newspaper and I don't have 20 worst disasters in the United States, not just in the other for the United States. Well, she was on TV, she was known as a candy queen. She was in NBC Studios. Yes, NBC Studios, Rockefeller Center, and nine of them. And they thought it might be a bomb, so they got evacuated. And she pretty much wandered around the streets and stuff. And, uh, it took a few days to get home. Because in New York, uh, on the Jersey side, we took a ferry over to New York, part of New Jersey, and that's where she parked it. And then took whatever we take to the city. Yeah, they would get more people from New Jersey than any other state got killed on my property. And the other transported bodies in the media for that to take back in the community. So, uh, so she needs a blast of course, uh, <laughs> but she has been two of the worst, worst of the She wasn't, you know, quite an inch ago. I mean, she was there in the smoke and all that stuff. So that's my story. I'm sticking. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was that in or around with the Marsh Theater? Was that at 10th Street? Thank you, Mr. Oh, I don't know. It was on that. Uh, okay, it was on that street. He just went back here for a half ago, not to get the name of Mark Street. <laughs> it's the one that's like if you're going to get these. That what street? Street 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 street
studio thing or something. Yeah. 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 Yes, March. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, who I just talked about, Kevin Royal, did, did, did I tell your story correctly? Is there anything yes, sir. correct or is it five? You were five and a half? Yeah. Okay. And the picture you put of Sandy, <laughs> which is exactly and I remember when the storm hit, I didn't know what was going on, but my parents probably figured that in. And turn on the radio in the car. And I just remember trash cans flying all over the place. I've never seen anything like that now. And then the power went out, and people inside couldn't see. So everyone that were that was pulled up next to the place turned their headlights on. So mm -hmm. people inside could at least see to get out. There was a, there was a gas station right there on the bypass. They saw it for sure now. Mm -hmm. trying to yeah. But it, which was basically right behind the sand. And I remember they brought in a truck with uh his lights on. Mm -hmm. She must have lived an hour trying to figure out how they got the home. But yeah. Yeah, that's I mean that that picture you show sure Brett. Mm -hmm. Sure Brett's back remembering what that place is like and three people Yeah. 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 Why do you went there first? Uh -huh. <laughs> and then when do you went there first? I'm glad, I'm glad to meet you. Well, first time, we were very fortunate. We were on the north side of town. Mm -hmm. And then when we came back, we had to zigzag through the country. That's why the guy that stopped and asked where I wouldn't know how he could get through all that. That's my dad talked in. So we didn't go by. Here we go to San Francisco, very much experiment on the strand. So he, Dad uh, navigated for him and he drove. Uh, he was he was trying to get out through the country and didn't know where to go. So that's how we uh, ended up with the ride. And the next day, my dad and my uncle went back to Marion with a gas can. And uh, yeah. I went with them. And that's when we went by the hands. The Pam's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some more. The drugstore? Yeah. We went that way. We couldn't be that high. I remember we came through there. Mm -hmm. If you go by where the, that uh, uh, mobile home park had been? We tried to. There was so much. I mean, just couldn't get down to do it. So he ended up going up the burn. And I remember seeing that marsh, Pam's, panorama place. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go on south from there, there was a place we always called the Thumb Farm. Yeah. 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 On south from Marsh before you get to 22. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, ponies hanging out in the trees. I remember because we lived down on the rip on the Gamboa Road there. So it come right straight through there. But I remember the ponies in the tree. I remember going to Marsh and they salvaged what they could, put it out on pages. I remember going there shopping, buying stuff. What little they could salvage. There were ponies in the trees? Yes. They found ponies all the way in that island. Yeah. Yeah, they was scouts there for islands. Yes, um, I was only about 10 at the time, and we were at church um, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And just to show you the power of a mother's love. We were in church and had the, the windows that cranked out so they turn the thing and angle and start hailing and then it, we lost power. And I don't know who said it or why they said it, but somebody said a storm was coming. My mother pushed all of us kids under the pews and the adults headed for the altar. And she told us not to get out from underneath that pew. Well, then eventually when they were done, they came back. And they said a tornado had hit a trailer port. 
Now we lived on 16th Street at the end of at that time the Fairfield Transport. I don't know what it's called now. And right away, our heart sunk. And I just remember all the people coming and all you know, the place to stay mm -hmm. if we didn't have a home. And so we had a home that was the longest silent car ride I had ever been in. Everything was dark. There's no power, no stars, no moon. We go down 16th Street. And just before we got to our house, the clouds parted, and there was the moon, and our house was standing. We had some budget windows, <laughs> and I just remember how kind people were to us, even though they didn't know for sure. Was that level for me? Oh, Thank you for sharing that. My story is nearly in time. I used to have a tornado and a bug. I would have been seven. My older brother would have been nine. My little brother would have been almost five. Um, with my mom and my father. Because my dad, who, he went down to his parents' house about five blocks away because in the, in the Palm Sunday 1956 tornado, their house, Three of the whole wall came down, so he thought he needed to be there. And I, I think a couple of my aunts and uncles maybe still live there. Um, ten kids and family, so they were able to really spread out. But um, and I remember they went um, had an uncle and aunt living in Lindsay, and my dad and brother went over there the next day or the day after. I think to get kerosene or more flashlights or something. But I didn't get to go, and I was really mad because my aunt had the little wiener dog adopted, and I want to go play with the dog. But anyway, you know, I was seven. But um, a few years ago, when my little brother passed, and I was over in the home instead of cleaning out things, I was cleaning out the closet, trying to figure out how my mom, my brother, my little brother, and I, I was sitting in that closet. I don't remember any noise, but I remember mm -hmm. the pitch black dark. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how else. We did. <laughs> At this time, I didn't take my grandson's house. So. Yeah. My story is, we were 10 years old. I was 10 years old. And we lived in Lapel, but we went to a Pentecostal church out on 9th Street. The storm came up, the power went out, they opened up the front and back doors and had cars with headlights. Things the young member outside the church were two lawn chairs sitting. Never got moved. Mm -hmm. We left dreams. You know, and when we went to Pentecostal church, they did not, they had this kid in one place, but they kept right on with the group, singing their service. Yes. I just want to thank you for being so honest in your reporting and your storytelling because anymore when we get information, the first thing we do is try to find five different ways of verification. But it's it, you you hear a lot of bell and uh the people I've talked to since we first met at the mm -hmm. Fairmount Library. Um mm -hmm. One one was on duty with the National Guard, and he said uh, when he got in that night back to Marion, he was on a jeep all night going from one place to another to trailer parks to God knows where else. And it's uh, I just appreciate it so much because mm -hmm. you ring a lot of bells, mm -hmm. a lot of good bells. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, it's a shared memory. Everybody, you know. As a story, Are there, is there anybody else? Yes. Well, I live about 10 miles west of Marion, and I worked for the state highway at the time. And we didn't know that the storm had hit. 
I believe about 10 miles north of Swayze. At about seven o'clock that night, we got a phone call from our bosses telling us to meet at our where we kept our equipment to put snow plows on our truck. Hmm. And we came to Marion and from 38th Street to Gas City, we cleared the road with the snow plows. Then the next day, they had us go to Rusherville, where we uncovered their fire trucks in the fire station, but they had all collapsed in. So, well, that's the first time I've heard anybody say they cleared the road with a snow plow. That's a new one for me. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, our dad worked at RCA and he was at work that night. My sister, me, my younger sister, my mom, my grandma was there when I did. My younger sister, she was sick. I remember my mom was giving her a sponge bath and the wonderful world of Disney just come on. And I'm so glad that I can walk out of But I remember the green sky and afterwards we went out and the dead spider. Not a sound. But my dad worked at RCA, which was, and we lived a little bit less than a mile from the PA on 54th Olympic Boulevard. So we kind of down by the river had a hill. Mm -hmm. the same place. So yeah, jumped over the hill, and the river was on the other side of the street. So it just, uh, but dad had to say, go out, clear out 16 miles, and come all the way back. It took him over an hour. To get home. The one thing that uh, hasn't been mentioned much is hell, and because um, uh, we live in Switzerland, right, my family, and um, the, the dad had his first new farm in '63, and um, it had literally baseball-sized hell and baseball-sized dents all over the car, and there was a lot of damage like that, even though Switzerland wasn't officially hit. And uh, so they uh, fixed the car, uh, and they were very, just like the rippers, somebody was telling me they were rippers. Everybody was in demand that they fixed cars. So I think they did a very uh, hasty job on the cars, and rather than pound the vents out and put a little bit of uh, Bondo, we call it, uh, they pretty much just filled the whole thing with Bondo, and the car looked good for about two years. And then metal and plastic spanning track with the bullets. In two years' time, you would see nothing but cars that had been fixed, or they call them spider webs. All those things started looking like yeah. spiders. Yeah. yeah. Well, a friend of mine worked at Mark, but she worked at the one that Stanley was over here in the Pen Room, and she went there later. But her husband went to pick her up at work. They lived on Barclay Road. And then a couple kids using the same home. But they were like starting to storm or something. They got and then they said, "Okay, you want to come ahead and go with me?" Thank goodness they did. So they threw the whole house away. Mm -hmm. and they, didn't mm -hmm. they were very fortunate. But mm -hmm. Nobody got hurt. So. Our neighbors had a lot of family that lived on 48th Street and had to start play a tornado fall on 38th and took all their houses out. Yeah, and the neighbors had a lot of relatives out there, and I remember. I uh, walked into a field on Saturday when it was fine, and it was in a hot. And the bank was still on it, it was still picking the stuff full of hot. And it uh, was planning all the time to do it. It was one house, the whole house was gone, but one section of the wall. And it had a picture of Christ and the Bible on the table underneath it. Mm -hmm. That's all that was left. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Lansing County, and I was a teenager when it hit. And I remember we were in the mobile home, talking to the ladies and my grandparents. We just got home from church. I'm sure we had Disney on too. And the weather report came on talking about bad weather. And my brother was scared, and my dad said, well, Look out there, you know, it's, it's right side, you can see the stars. and what happened to that weather then? And a couple minutes later, my grandfather was across saying, You need to come over here. And we found out that 
Um, my dad's youngest brother, his in laws, had been hit with a tornado outside of Rome and destroyed their house. And so we took care of the little one year old daughter while they were in the hospital. Thankfully, her parents were fine, they had just gotten blown out. But um, we were over there the next day cleaning up, and on either side of them were students who lived that I went to school with. And I think he went to Ed Thurman, mm -hmm. and I think he was the younger brother of the guy in my class. And I remember his brother Dick telling us that when that hit, they were home alone, and they went down to the basement and lay on the couch, and he lay on top of his little brother Ed, and the wall came in and came down, but did not hit them. Because it's, and, it, it landed on the couch, on right. the back of the couch, and it didn't. And the tornado then went on into Wells County, and it was just one climb over from where I was in that level there. Mm. But thankfully, nobody did. I also have to remember something else. I was on the crutches after I went to the hospital, mm -hmm. and um, my girlfriend would come over and play 45 records and keep me company. And I was on crutches, and so there's a new twist went out. So I'm on the crutches trying to do the twist. <laughs> and when I did, a piece of the hood popped out of my foot. I had to go back in the hospital and have more surgery. And I still have that piece of wood still in there. <laughs> Make it into a necklace. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to mention I can stop We we went to the basement, but I remember the communities that you mentioned, Wyatt and Dunn Lab mm -hmm. in Elkhart County, and um Linda Johnson came to um that area after that. That was kind of the thing to go um as a president. Did you see him? Were you born? weren't born yet, sorry. No, I was born. Oh, okay. I saw the demonstration. Yeah. Once the, the randomness of it, this is uh, interesting. I just saw one picture of my car. Mm -hmm. It just happened to land on the tools. And on top of the car is an eight foot long tuber floor. And you gotta wonder how did, you know, that just pop down and not go off. And so I had to drop that there, the car was stopped, and when it was over with, it was so. And you weren't sitting there. <laughs> you sitting in the car. Another interesting thing I heard was over at Burn, they had Pine Lake, and when the tornado went through there, I heard it sucked all the water out of it. Really? I, I never heard that, but I heard that about the lake of Coos Lake. I heard that about Coos Lake. Nothing about Pine Lake. I didn't think it was fine. Anyone else? If not, I wanted to let you know there's some, you probably saw uh, some some uh, newspaper stories and pictures laid out on the table over here. That's provided by the library. And then in the back, there's some more that uh, Brenda and Keith brought if you want to take a look. That stuff. So, what was that? Making sure we plug up on the YouTube. Oh, yes, the, the video, Death Out of Darkness. Mm -hmm. When I came down, I saw the thing playing. Oh, yeah, this is. I don't know if that's available anywhere. Rhonda, could you tell us about that video that's playing? Yeah, the video playing uh, that is something we have. Room on a VHS tape, and we uh, had it digitized. There's a little uh, explanation there on the ether beside it. It was filmed here and there by the TV station. And uh, the little write up tells how they were filming it using car batteries because there was no power. Um, there was, it also says they did not put a soundtrack with it because they didn't have enough money. So it's just showing. Marion, you know, a few days afterwards. And, you know, this is, the, as far as I know, this is the only place that has, I don't know, it was here when I came in 2001. I'm not sure where, how we got it and where it came from. And as far as I know, it's the only copy. So if I wanted to see it, I would come here and, and it was digitized, I could watch it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask for it. And just come to the Indiana room, let's look at the computer and make sure you watch it. Yeah. 
So that, if that's all we know about it, just a little write up that was in the yeah. case with the VHS and where it came from. Not really sure. So, um, how long is it? Uh, it's not very long. It's not real long. And it's not real clear. It, you know, it's been copied a few times from whatever they put it on to the VHS to to this. So we just follow the other time to do that. So um, yeah, sure, you're welcome to come come to the end room. We can cover that. So yeah, we want to thank Janice for coming tonight and sharing with us. Uh, for coming in. I'll play our people on Zoom. Yeah, we had some blue glitches here and there, but I think we got um, most of it here. Uh, yeah, like I said, we have a few things from our file. We have a big file on the tornadoes, not just this tornado, but other tor 56 and other tornadoes. Uh, we have files and everything. So these are just a few things from that that you can come to the Indiana room to see. Um, and then, you know, make sure you go over and check out Janice's books. And we appreciate everyone coming. And thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing the people on Zoom. Where might they be able to find your book? Well, Amazon and on my website. Or a local bookstore. So we have a library. Probably at Barnes. We have a library too. We have copies to check out. Sure. The mm -hmm. and we'll so, and those are like that for one of these things. Those are the same on the other. I think I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, well, that's not a whole question. No, no, no. I'm going to ask you to write down here one thing. You're going to ask me to do that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, thanks for showing that. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to do that. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah,